Hey, Bilaval here. We heard from so many of you about how much you enjoyed listening to my conversation with law professor and ethicist Nita Farahani on how wearable devices like earbuds, fitness trackers, and VR headsets may soon be able to read our minds thanks to artificial intelligence. So we thought we'd share Nita's TED Talk on something she deeply believes in, your right to mental privacy. We hope you find it as illuminating as we have. And if you haven't listened to my conversation with her, please check it out and get ready for some provocative stuff. You're listening to TED Talks Daily. I'm Elise Hugh. When computers are inside our brains, where do we end and where do the devices begin? Ethical questions about brain-computer interfaces are neurotechnology ethicist Nita Farahani's specialty. In her TED 2023 talk, she braids personal experience with her technological and legal expertise to help us think through the thornier questions about the near future. Hi, I'm Bilaval Sadu, host of TED's newest podcast, The TED AI Show, where I speak with the world's leading experts, artists, journalists, to help you live and thrive in a world where AI is changing everything. I'm stoked to be working with IBM, our official sponsor for this episode. Now, the path from Gen AI pilots to real-world deployments is often filled with roadblocks, such as barriers to free data flow. But what if I told you there's a way to deploy AI wherever your data lives. With Watson X, you can deploy AI models across any environment, above the clouds helping pilots navigate flights, and on lots of clouds helping employees automate tasks. On-prem, so designers can access proprietary data, and on the edge, so remote bank tellers can assist customers. Watson X helps you deploy AI wherever you need it, so you can take your business wherever it needs to go. Learn more at ibm.com slash Watson X and start infusing intelligence where you need it the most. Teams with big ideas start in JIRA, the only project management tool you need to plan and track work across any team. JIRA even helps our team here at TED, keeping us in sync to deliver the big ideas our listeners love. And there's a lot more that teams will love about JIRA. It keeps cross-functional tasks organized with a project's timeline. That's always really key so that we make our deadlines. And cross-functional teams like TED working in one tool gives leaders the important visibility they need to make better business decisions. Get started on your next big idea today in JIRA. If you make decks at work, you should make the switch to Canva presentations. Canva presentations might be the most visually impressive presentations you'll ever use. Start with a designer-made template and add images, videos, and graphics from Canva's massive media library. You can even add smooth slide transitions and data animations to really set your presentation apart. You'll love the presentations you can quickly and easily design with Canva, and your audience will too. Love your work with Canva presentations at canva.com. Today, we know and track virtually nothing that's happening in our own brains. But in a future that is coming much faster than you realize, all of that is about to change. We're now familiar with sensors in our smartwatches to our rings that track everything from our heartbeats to our footsteps, breaths, body temperature, even our sleep. Now, consumer neurotech devices are being sold worldwide to enable us to track our own brain activity. As companies from Meta to Microsoft, Snap, and even Apple, begin to embed brain sensors in our everyday devices, like our earbuds, headphones, headbands, watches, and even wearable tattoos, we're reaching an inflection point in brain transparency. And those are just some of the company names we're familiar with. There are so many more. Consumer neurotech devices are moving from niche products with limited applications to becoming the way in which we'll learn about our own brain activity our controller for virtual reality and augmented reality, and one of the primary ways we'll interact with all of the rest of our technology. Even conservative estimates of the neurotech industry put it at more than $38 billion by 2032. This new category of technology presents unprecedented possibility, both good and bad. 
Consider how our physical health and well-being are increasing while neurological disease and suffering continue to rise. 55 million people around the world are struggling with dementia, with more than 60 to 70 percent of them suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Nearly a billion people struggle with mental health and drug use disorders. Depression affects more than 300 million. Consumer neurotech devices can finally enable us to treat our brain health and wellness as seriously as we treat the rest of our physical well-being. But making our brains transparent to others also introduces extraordinary risks, which is why before it's too late to do so, we must change the basic terms of service for neurotechnology in favor of individual rights. I say this not just as a law professor who believes in the power of law, nor just a philosopher trying to flesh out norms, but as a mother who's been personally and profoundly impacted by the use of neurotechnology in my own life. On Mother's Day in 2017, as my daughter, Callista, lay cradled in my arms, she took one last beautiful breath. After a prolonged hospitalization, complications following infections claimed her life. The harrowing trauma that she endured and we witnessed stretched into weeks, and I was left with lasting trauma that progressed into post-traumatic stress disorder. Sleep escaped me for years, as each time I closed my eyes, I relived everything from the first moments that I was pushed out of the emergency room to her gut-wrenching cries. Ultimately, it was the help of a talented psychologist using exposure therapy and my use of neurofeedback that enabled me to sleep through the night. For others who are suffering from traumatic memories, an innovative new approach using decoded neurofeedback, or DECNEF, may offer reprieve. This groundbreaking approach uses machine learning algorithms to identify specific brain activity patterns, including those associated with traumatic memories. Participants then play a game that enables them to retrain their brain activity on positive associations instead. If I had had DECNEF available to me at the time, I might have overcome my PTSD more quickly without having to relive every sound, terror, and smell in order to do so. I'm not the only one. Sarah described herself as being at the end of her life, no longer in a life worth living because of her severe and intractable depression. Then, using implanted brain sensors that reset her brain activity like a pacemaker for the brain, Sarah reclaimed her will to live. While implanted neurotechnology advances have been extraordinary, it's the everyday brain sensors that are embedded in our ordinary technology that I believe will impact the majority of our lives. Like the one-third of adults and nearly one-quarter of children who are living with epilepsy for whom conventional anti-seizure medications fail. Now, Researchers from Israel to Spain have developed brain sensors using the power of AI in pattern recognition and consumer electroencephalography to enable the detection of epileptic seizures minutes to up to an hour before they occur, sending potentially life-saving alerts to a mobile device. Regular use of brain sensors could even enable us to detect the earliest stages of the most aggressive forms of brain tumors like glioblastoma, where early detection is crucial to saving lives. The same could hold true for Parkinson's disease to Alzheimer's, traumatic brain injury, ADHD, and even depression. We may even change our brains for the better. The brain training game industry, worth a staggering $6.5 billion in 2021, was for years met with controversy because of unsupported scientific claims about their efficacy. But now, some brain training platforms like Cognifit have proven powerful in improving brain processing speeds, memory, reasoning, and even executive functioning when played repeatedly over time. 
When paired with neurofeedback devices for learning reinforcement, this could revolutionize how we learn and adapt to change. Other breakthroughs could be transformational for the human experience. Today, most human brain studies are based on a very small number of participants engaged in very specific tasks in a controlled laboratory environment. With widespread use of brain sensors, the data we could have to learn about the human brain would exponentially increase. With sufficiently large data sets of long-term, real-world data from people engaged in everyday activity, we just might address everything from neurological disease and suffering to creating transformational possibilities for the human experience. But all of this will only be possible if people can confidently share their brain data without fear that it will be misused against them. You see, the brain data that will be collected and generated by these devices won't be collected in traditional uh, laboratory environments or in clinical research studies run by physicians and scientists. Instead, it will be the sellers of these new devices, the very companies who've been commodifying our personal data for years which is why we can't go into this new era naive about the risks or complacent about the challenges that the collection and sharing our brain data will pose. Scientific hurdles can and will be addressed in time, but the social hurdles will be the most challenging. Support for this show comes from LinkedIn. If you are a B2B marketer, you know how noisy the ad space can be. A lot of noise. If your message isn't targeted to the right audience, it'll just disappear. But with LinkedIn ads, you can be a lot more precise. You can reach the professionals who are more likely to find your ad relevant because LinkedIn has targeting capabilities to help you reach folks by job title, industry, company, and more. You can stand out with LinkedIn ads and start converting your B2B audience into high quality leads right away. I've learned so much about the vastness of LinkedIn because it does seem like everybody is on there. So it's helping me find some leads or think of connections that I wouldn't have otherwise thought of without the technology. It's helping me stay informed and stay educated. Start converting your B2B audience into high quality leads today. We will even give you a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash TED audio to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash TED audio. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn the place to be, to be. Hi, I'm Bilaval Sadu, host of TED's newest podcast, The TED AI Show, where I talk with the world's leading experts, artists, journalists, to help you live and thrive in a world where AI is changing everything. I'm stoked to be working with IBM, our official sponsor for this episode. In a recent report published by the IBM Institute of Business Value, among those surveyed, one in three companies pause an AI use case after the pilot phase. And we've all been there, right? You get hyped about the possibilities of AI, spin up a bunch of these pilot projects, and then crickets. Those pilots are trapped in silos, your resources are exhausted, and scaling feels daunting. What if, instead of hundreds of pilots, you had a holistic strategy that's built to scale? That's what IBM can help with. They have 65,000 consultants with generative AI expertise who can help you design, integrate, and optimize AI solutions. Learn more at ibm.com slash consulting. Because using AI is cool, but scaling AI across your business, that's the next level. Unlike the technologies of the past that track and hack the human brain, brain sensors provide direct access to the part of ourselves that we hold back that we don't express through our words and our actions. Brain data, in many instances, will be more sensitive than the personal data of the past because it reflects our feelings, our mental states, our emotions, our preferences, our desires, even our very thoughts. I would never have wanted the data that was collected as I worked through the trauma of my personal loss to have been commodified, shared, and analyzed by others. These aren't just hypothetical risks. Take EnterTech, a Hangzhou-based company who has collected millions of instances of brain activity data as people have engaged in mind-controlled car racing, sleeping, working, even using neurofeedback with their devices. They've already entered into partnerships with other companies 
to share and analyze that data. Unless people have individual control over their brain data, it will be used for micro-targeting or worse, instead of treating dementia. Like the employees worldwide who've already been subject to brain surveillance in the workplace to track their attention and fatigue, to governments developing brain biometrics to authenticate people at borders, to interrogate, to interrogate criminal suspects' brains, and even weapons that are being crafted to disable and disorient the human brain. Brain wearables will have not only read but write capabilities, creating risks that our brains can be hacked, manipulated, and even subject to targeted attacks. We must act quickly to safeguard against the very real and terrifying risks to our innermost selves. Recognizing a human right to cognitive liberty would offer those safeguards. Cognitive liberty is a right from interference by others, but it is also a right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences to enable human flourishing. To achieve this, we need to recognize three interrelated human rights and update our understanding of them to secure to us a right to mental privacy, to safeguard us from interference with our automatic reactions, our emotions and our thoughts. Freedom of thought as an absolute human right to protect us from interception, manipulation, and punishment of our thoughts. And self-determination to secure self-ownership over our brains and mental experiences, to access and change them if we want to do so. There are important efforts already underway, from the UN to UNESCO and nations worldwide, over rights and regulations around neurotechnologies. But those rights need to be better aligned with a broader set of digital rights. Cognitive liberty is an update to liberty in the digital age, as an umbrella concept of human flourishing across digital technologies. Because the right way forward isn't through metaverse rights or AI rights or neurotech rights and the like. It's to recognize that these technologies don't exist in silos, but in combination, affecting our brains and mental experiences. We are literally at a moment before. And I mean a moment. Consumer brain wearables have already arrived, and the commodification of our brains has already begun. It's now just a question of scale. We haven't yet passed the inflection point where most of our brains can be directly accessed and changed by others but it is about to happen, giving us a final moment to make a change so that we don't look back in a few years' time and lament the world we've left behind. We can and should be hopeful and deliberate about the choices we make now to secure a right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences. The possibilities, if we do so, are limited only by our imagination. Thank you.